Hey, I'm Joe Bob Briggs, and we've got a special presentation tonight of a movie that is one of the most requested films in our library, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. But uh, guess what? It's not the kiddos who request this movie. It's the goofy grown-ups that want to see this movie. This is one of those movies that you get at the video store to watch with your kid, but only because you want to watch it. And uh, I tell you what, let's do. One of the crack TNT stagehands is at this very moment ringing up the director of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, Mr. Mel Stewart, at his home in Los Angeles. And Mel has been on the show before last fall when we showed his documentary on the Kennedy assassination, Four Days in November. And uh, people have had so many questions about this movie over the years that I'm going to make Mel hang on the phone with us, and we're, we're just going to ask him these questions as we go along as we show the movie tonight. And if you've never seen it, though, don't worry, because we won't give anything away. But it's become something of a cult film, and so people are very curious about it. So do we have Mel? Mel? Hi. Mel. Hi, Joe. Hi. Uh, 27 years since this movie came out, but it was not a huge hit in 1960. 71. It's, it's, it's kind of a bigger hit now. Why was that, do you think? Um, I don't know. Perhaps the distribution was bad. I know we came out on a weekend with a picture called Ben about rats, <laughs> and uh, somehow they all went to see the picture about Ben and the rats, and we were uh, put to the side. It, uh -huh. I, it's, it's just maybe we didn't open up in the right theaters, too, or had enough of a campaign. Yeah, one of those crazy things. Well, it's almost as though people didn't understand it in 1971, and yet it's a classic today. How did, how did you decide to to, uh, to make this movie? Because you, you were a guy known for adult comedies and serious documentaries. Why would you suddenly make a kid's film? It's a very simple story and kind of fantastic. My daughter, Madeline, who was about 10 at the time, came to me and said, Daddy, make a picture about this book. I like this book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And that's the way she thought it was done. So I was working with David Walper, his famous producer, and he said, okay. And he went, he went for somehow he thought of going to the Quaker Oats factory and saying, you should have a Wonka bar. There's a great publicity stunt for you. Put up the money. And they put up approximately $3 million, which was a great deal of money in those days, to make the film. It's as simple as that. And how long did that take? Uh, the film took about, uh, oh, from the beginning to the end, it took oh, about three quarters of a year. But to raise that money? Uh, oh, oh, to raise the money? Yeah. No, David Wolper is quite fabulous. He raised it in, in a matter of weeks. Really? Because he's very good at that kind of thing. Okay. Well, now, we're going to stop right there because I don't want to talk too much about the movie so that we spoil it for people who don't know what's coming because it is kind of a very unpredictable movie, and it has a style all its own. So if you haven't seen it, it's fun to not know what's coming next. So stay on the phone, Mel, and we're going to watch the beginning of your, what I would think you might consider your masterpiece. Is that right? I think so. I consider it that. Okay. We'll roll the film, and, and one more thing, Mel. Why did you change the title from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which was the name of the children's book, to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? Because Charlie uh, is the name of the child hero, and Willy Wonka is the name of the factory owner. Right. Uh, there, were, there are two or three reasons. Number one, we thought it would sound, uh, oh, it sounds silly, we, we thought it would sound more adult with Charlie, uh, with, with Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory rather than Charlie. There was another reason, uh, a group of, uh, it was the mad 70s, the beginning then, and a group of African-American uh, activists came to us and said that Charlie had racial implications for black people, and they asked us if we would change it. And since uh, that went along with our plans anyway, we were more than glad to accommodate them. Okay. All right, well, we wouldn't want to offend anybody, especially in the movie responsible for the Lifetime theme song, of Sammy Davis Jr. So that's all I'm going to say. Let's go. Roll the movie. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory on TNT. The Wonka Bar. The scrump delicious Wonka Bar. I have one right here. This thing would probably fetch, I don't know, a thousand dollars on the open market because of all the Willy Wonka collectors out there. So. Mel, are you still there? I am here. Mel Stewart, director of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Mel, Quaker Oats had plans to actually sell the Wonka bar, right? What happened? Well, they had a year to get their act together. For whatever reason, they never were able to get the production factory going to make the bar, and it sort of just dissipated after the year. The whole plan dissipated after the film was um, came out. I see. 
All right, now, The Candyman, Sammy Davis' theme song. Did you ever think about having Sammy Davis as The Candyman? Uh, I remember the first time Brickus and Newley played the song for us, I knew it was going to be a fantastic hit somewhere. And uh, Anthony Newley wanted to play the part of The Candyman in the show, as did uh, Sammy Davis Jr., yeah. And the reason I took neither one of them was because I wanted the picture to appear to be a fantasy. At the time, Gene Wilder wasn't that well known, and I wanted everything to seem like it was in a fantasy world, and as soon as you saw some popular entertainer, uh, the fantasy would uh, leave. Uh, and I wanted the reality of fantasy. Right. Well, the candy store owner did a good job on the, on the song, didn't you think? Yes. Oh, he was fine, but... Uh, Nobody knew quite who he was, and that's what helped it be more real. Right. Where does the story actually take place? It looks kind of old world. Uh, we went to Munich to shoot it because the streets looked like a never-never land. I think the trick in children's fantasies are to make them look as real as possible, and so you can be as fantastic as you want because people believe the reality. We picked that town because it, had, it wasn't like being in New York or Chicago or Paris. You just didn't know where you were. Right. Okay. Well, we won't give anything away because we're moving on with the search for the five Wonka grand prize winners. So we'll just uh, roll the film. And well, oh, one, one other thing, Mel. Yeah. With the, 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 the character of Winkleman, who comes in and out of the, of the story at many times, um, was actually your son, right? It was my son. One reason I cast him that way was because I could tell him exactly how to read it. And being a good kid, he read it exactly the way I wanted him to. And now he's going on to a successful uh, a television career in Britain. He's a, he's a big shot director over yeah, in Europe, Yeah, right? he's got five shows on in, in, in England. That's great. Okay, roll the film. Hi, I'm Juliet Honan with the TNT McDonald's movie break. And a look at what's playing in theaters this weekend. Christopher Walken heads a cast of young actors in Suicide King, a Tarantino-esque Kidnap caper. If I let you go, you won't just back out on this whole deal. Hey, Ray. You got my word. Jennifer Aniston is looking for love in all the wrong places in The Object of My Affection, which co-stars Paul Rudd. Are you sleeping with her? Vince, I'm gay. Also opening up this weekend is another installment in the Major League movies. This one's called Back to the Miners and stars Scott Bakula. DreamWorks offers up a movie called Paulie about a talking parrot. You can't talk. Of course I can talk. For the TNT McDonald's movie break, I'm Juliet Honan. Look, a shooting star. Hey, if you close your eyes and make a wish, it could come true. Try. Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory on TNT. Okay, here we are back with Mel Stewart on the phone. Mel is the director of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And uh, Mel, the kid who plays Charlie is pretty dang good. Where did you find him? Uh, we were searching for Charlies all over the country, and our casting director came up with a young man from uh, Cleveland. He was in a local Cleveland uh, theater group. And he came to New York, and we uh, uh, tested him, and we felt this was absolutely the perfect uh, Charlie. Unfortunately, or fortunately for him, perhaps, he didn't want to pursue a film uh, career and became a veterinarian. So this was Peter Ostrom's only film appearance. That's right. And then he became a vet. Mm -hmm. And the woman who plays the, his mother is also very talented. Yes. Uh, originally, we had somebody else. Uh, we were trying to cast somebody else for that part. A uh, lady came in. She read beautifully. She was fantastic. I said to her, here's a chance to do uh, Willy Wonka. We're going to Munich. We're going to make a movie. She said, I've got to think it over because I've got a possible television offer. I said, you can't take a television show instead of a feature. She said, let me think it over. And the next day she called and said, I'm going to do the television show. And her name was Jean Stapleton. And the sitcom was All in the Family. 
You almost lured Jean Stapleton away from all <laughs> in the family good. to she do was Willy good. Wonka. <laughs> and, uh, but it, the part went to Diana Soul. I think right, and she was very good in it, yeah. too. One more thing before we continue. I understand you cut out an entire sequence somewhere along in this part of the movie, a very expensive sequence. Mm -hmm. What was uh, that? Well, I uh, cut it out because for some reason people didn't laugh at it. It was supposed to be a comedy sequence. A man goes up to the top of a mountain frozen and cold and asks the guru, what is the meaning of life? And the guru, instead of answering, says, have you got a Wonka bar? I want to see if I can win a golden ticket. And the man gives him his last Wonka bar, and the guru opens it up, and there's no golden ticket on it, and he throws it down, very disappointed. And the man then says, okay, guru, I gave you my Wonka bar. Tell me, what is the meaning of life? And the guru looks at him and says, life is a disappointment. And yeah. I thought it was terribly funny, funny, and everybody on the cast did. But when we played it in the movies, as a screen test, in the testing, nobody laughed at that line. And I asked the psychiatrist to come with me, and he came, and he said, Mel, you don't understand. People aren't laughing because for many people in the audience, life is a disappointment. And it was a very good rule of comedy. You can't get too close to the truth. Right. Okay. Well, no one's disappointed when they watch Willy Wonka in its completed form. So let's get back to the hunt for the golden tickets. Do these golden tickets still exist, by the way? Oh, uh, one in my office. You have the only golden ticket. I have ticket. the only one. And, uh, and No, no, I, there's two. I gave one to my son, and I kept one, and uh, I won't part with it. Okay. Roll the film. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory on TNT. I love that dance sequence with Jack Albertson. Jack Albertson was probably the most famous person in the movie at the time this was released. And... Um, Mel, what was Jack Albertson like on the set? We're talking to Mel Stewart, director of Willy Wonka. Uh, he was one of these people that kept everybody together. A very charming, charming man, and everybody loved him, and uh, everybody loved to have him around. That must have been, that looked like a fairly difficult sequence, that dance. Mm -hmm. Well, the original idea was people from the studio and so forth that said, let's have a dance and break out the picture and go in the streets and do it like uh, Oliver and and have hundreds of people from the village coming down and so forth. And I said, no, 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 wrong. We've got to make it as realistic as possible because we cannot disturb the documentary, in a sense, feeling of the picture. So the idea was that we had to stage the dance in that narrow room around the bed of the four grandparents and, uh, and keep it inside and keep it small. Otherwise, you would lose reality. Right. And uh, it was difficult. But Jack was great, and Peter was great, and it, it, just, it just worked out very well for us. That's great. The, the fraudulent ticket winner from Paraguay, you told me that that was actually a picture of Martin Bormann, the Nazi. Right. Uh, it, it's true. We thought it'd be, uh, it, well, but I think the joke was too inside. There are not many people that know who Martin Bormann, the Nazi, was, yeah. although he was the last person that was close to Hitler. I think it probably would have worked better and funnier if we had a picture of Hitler there, but uh, those are the things that happened. Right. One thing that did work is the little girl in the chemistry class who says, I opened hundreds of Wonka bars. Who, who was the little girl? Well, that was my reward to my daughter, Madeline. She came up with the idea for the book, so we gave her part in the picture. And that was her. And she did a good job. With oh, her yeah, line. very good. All right. I'll, I'll set you up for some more questions, Mel, after we get back from, from the movie. Here's where the movie really takes off, and... You were determined to hold back the appearance of Willy Wonka to the last possible minute, weren't you? Absolutely. Uh, it, it was a calculated risk. We said, well, everybody sit through the beginning and wonder where Willy Wonka was. But I think the suspense of his opening is, is, is it's worth the wait. Okay, don't give it away. Roll the film. You don't carry your lawnmower. Why carry your trimmer? Introducing Trimalon. It's both a mower and a trimmer. Its powerful engine makes the tallest weeds a pushover. No more tangled lines or dangerous steel blades. Trimalon's patented tri-line delivers a no-clog, even cut. Want a closer cut? Foundation, fences, trees. Trimalon goes where others can't. Smaller yard? Trimalon is ideal. Trimalon. For more information, call 1-800-257-5700. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory on TNT. Well, Gene Wilder just suddenly appears 45 minutes into the movie, 
and he takes over the movie, doesn't he? I'm talking to Mel Stewart, the director of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And Gene, Mel, Gene Wilder seems perfect for this part now, in retrospect. Were you always so sure he was perfect for the part? Uh, we were casting in New York again, and we saw a lot of people as possible Willy Wonkas, among them Joel Gray, who's a wonderful actor. And one day, the casting person uh, sent in Gene Wilder, and he walked in the room, and I said to myself, this is the man that must be Willy Wonka. Nobody else can do it. I don't know what it was. I just said, it's him. And in fact, uh, as he left, I turned to Dave Wolf, who was with me, and said, I've got to tell him he's got the part. And Dave said, no, 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 the, the price will go up. I said, no, no, don't worry about the price. We have to have him. And I ran to the elevator. It was in the Plaza Hotel. I said, you have the part. You are fantastic. And it, it just was. I don't think there's anybody that could play it like you. That must have made him very happy. Mm-hmm. And, well, he has that impression in the movie because everyone loves Willy Wonka's first appearance in that movie. That is just a great scene. Yeah. Uh, again, we worked on that very hard. We wanted to, to be opposite what you think it would be, a man strolling out and being happy and all that stuff. So we gave him this little uh, limp, and he walks out, and then the whole trick was for him to fall forward, do a, a front flip, which I certainly would never do. And he, uh, Gene worked with two acrobats. Uh, German acrobats to get the stunt uh, perfect, and, uh, and there it was, and I think it just made a very nice opening. Yeah. Also, everyone loves the chocolate room, which was designed by a pretty famous designer, Harper Goff. Mm -hmm. uh, the chocolate room, number one, we went to, one of the reasons we went to Germany, to, to Bavaria Studios in Munich, is they had this enormous stage, and they were quite confident they could make a river that looked like chocolate. The second thing is Harper Goff, who did Fantastic Voyage and other wonderful films, he's just, just a genius. And he created this wonderful set with the waterfall and everything else. And it was part of my fantasy also. I've always wanted to be in a place like that with crazy colors and, and flowing things. And uh, he just put it all together. Quite a genius. Today you'd have to do a lot of that with computers probably, right? Well, yeah, I think they would do it with computers, but uh, I, I've been asked uh, if I would ever work, if it would have been easier with, with computers, and probably would have been, but I wouldn't have done it. I wanted everybody to feel that there were no tricks in this movie, as, or as few tricks as possible. I want them to believe that really existed. Right. One, what we just watched was the central song of the movie, Pure Imagination, what a great song, and Gene Wilder does a great job singing that song. Did you see that as the central moment in the movie? Uh, his entrance in that song is a central moment, and uh, nobody, when we hired Gene, we didn't know that he could carry a tune, but uh, we were quite pleased to find out he could carry it so well. And uh, he does a beautiful job on it, and the tune with its chordal structure and its, 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 its jumping melodic line, for me, is a very special uh, a special song, and I've heard jazz groups play it, and it's, it comes out quite extraordinarily. That's great. All right, we're going back to the movie now. And Mel, this thing looks like it cost 90 million bucks. You really got your Deutschmarks worth <laughs> over there in Germany, didn't in you? In those days, three million went a long way. <laughs> okay. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory on TNT. Oompa loompa doompa dee doo. We have a perfect puzzle for you. Mel Stewart, the director of Willy Wonka, is hanging on the phone with us. And Mel, the Oompa Loompas make a wonderful chorus. Where did you find that many midgets? Are, th are those midgets or dwarves? Oh, uh, well, uh, we, they call them little people today, but the midgets are the people who are perfectly uh, formed, and the dwarves are the people that have a slightly larger head. I see. And we had to go all over Europe to find them. Uh, uh, we found them in Turkey, in Malta, in uh, Germany, and the lead Oompa Loompa comes from uh, Britain, where he works with the Shakespeare uh, in, in Shakespeare plays, and he's quite a marvelous actor. Did they were they able to sing all those Oompa Loompa songs? Well, the problem was that uh, coming from these different countries, they couldn't sing it. Uh, they didn't understand English. We just did sign language. We we use sign language a great deal to get the parts going. So we had a group sing it in America and then just superimposed it on the film. I see. Well, now the message of the Oompa Loompas seems to be that if a parent lets a kid get away with bad behavior, then the kid should just be sort of disposed of. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, let's say I think everybody sort of felt that they're going to come back all right, but I think the message is a very good one. I believe in it, along with Mr. Walker. If a kid is bad, does bad things, he should be punished and not uh, coddled. Simple rules, but uh, I use it on my kids, and they grow up very, very well. Yeah. Well, I think this is why a few of the reviewers said that the movie is too dark. Were you surprised by that? I was very surprised, because I don't think uh, uh, that the uh, young people think it's too dark. They, in their hearts, know that Mr. Wonker is saying the right thing. And uh, I think children are smarter than adults usually give them credit for. And that's why the film is full of quotes from Shakespeare and, and jingles and wordplay and everything else. It was an adult picture made for children, and the children respond to it ex exactly the way I, th I, I hope they would. Yeah, well, history has proven the reviewers wrong anyway. So let's continue with the totally unpredictable Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. This must have been a fun set to go to every day, right, Mel? It was the most fun because we were living in a world of fantasy, and everybody felt that way. Yeah, great. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory on TNT. Mel Stewart, the director of Willy Wonka, is here on the phone. And Mel, I saw an interview with Denise Nickerson, the girl who played Violet Beauregard. And she said you made her stay in that giant blueberry bubble for eight hours, including while everybody else left her there and went to lunch. Is that true? Well, I don't know if it was eight hours, but we certainly left her there. We couldn't get her out. Uh, unless we, we had to take the whole thing apart, it would have just cost too much production time. So I think we fed her while she was rolling around in the in the uh, outfit. But it was it was a very complicated uh, piece of work, and we just had a she had to sacrifice herself for the good of the picture, I guess. Well, she uh, thinks but, she may uh, have back pain make it up this to day as a result of that blueberry bubble. <laughs> And apparently Jack Albertson wasn't having any fun either, because apparently the reason he looked scared in the fizzy lifting room is that he was in enormous pain. How did those things work? <laughs> well, uh, the only way we could lift some people up, get it done, was to put them in a harness and make the scene black behind them and have these thin wires, which were painted black, move them up and down. And I think probably at his age and so forth, it wasn't the most uh, pleasant experience uh, that you could have to be hoisted up and down on a thin wire in this suit. Okay. Well, in other words, you're a slave driver, Mel, all in the service <laughs> the of art. The only way to get a picture done. <laughs> Back to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. When did you become aware that this was a cult classic? Uh, after a few years, people kept, number one, asking me uh, for copies of the film. Then the video sold very well, and uh, the reviewers, in looking back at it, saw something else in it. And I think there was a whole generation of the 60s, uh, the late 60s and the 70s, that grew up with it and sort of kept going back to it for their kids. That's great. Okay, good. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory on TNT. Okay, Veruca Salt, that actress is named Julie Dawn Cole, and her song and dance number, I Want It Now, is definitely the bratty highlight of all the bratty behavior in this movie. We're with Mel Stewart on the phone, the director of Willy Wonka, and Mel, that number was quite a tour de force. It uh, was a tour de force from a wonderful young British actress. Uh, Julie, and she just, I think, was the one person I thought would really go on to become a superstar because she just has it. If, 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 if you look at the scene, you look at her face, you look at her movements, for a 12-year-old uh, 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 girl to do these things is just miraculous as far as I'm concerned. I enjoyed working with her a great deal. Yeah. Well, Julie Don Cole still works on the British stage and in London television. She was in EastEnders on PBS. But, Mel, I want to ask you about one more thing. As we mentioned before, this movie was based on a famous children's book by Raoul Dahl, and you weren't too happy with the screenplay that Dahl turned in for the movie. Um, no, I wasn't. Uh, Raoul Dahl, who wrote the book, was a wonderful writer, but uh, writing a book is not writing a screenplay. And uh, we were very unhappy with much of it, and I, I was, had a young man working for me, uh, just as a your researcher named D uh, David Selsa, and I brought him to Munich with me, sort of locked him up in a room and said, 
rewrite the script until it's perfect. And he just had this incredible talent. And he wrote, the, he rewrote the script and the script that you uh, see. A great deal of it was written by uh, by David Seltzer. He never got credit for it, but he did go on to write pictures like The Omen. Right. And so very successful pictures. Things. And don't give away the best part of the David Seltzer story because first everyone needs to see the wonderful conclusion to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. So roll the film. Is this your proudest achievement, Mel? Yes. I'm most proud about this picture. Wonderful. Back to Joe Bob's Last Call on TNT. And so ends Willy Wonka with Charlie accepting the keys to the Chocolate Kingdom. And Mel Stewart, the director, is still here on the phone. And Mel, that wasn't originally how the film was supposed to end. How did, the, how did it end originally? Uh, in Raul Dahl's script, it ended with Grandpa saying, Yippee! And... As you make a picture, sometimes you don't look to every detail. And when we got to the last uh, shooting day there, and, and uh, uh, really Wonka was supposed to go up in the balloon, I looked at the script and said, Yippee, we can't end this way. Where's Salsa, the writer? And uh, David had gone back to the United States, and he was in a cabin in Maine re uh, recovering from this ordeal. And I said, get the kid on the phone. And we called him long distance, and I had all the apparatus there in the and the balloon and the blue screen and stuff. I said, I need an end line. i got to have an end line for this picture, and I'm going to hold the line open from Maine to Munich until you give it to me. He said, okay. And he walked away. And about a minute later, he came back, and he said, here's the last lines of the picture. Wonka says to Charlie, don't forget what happens to someone who suddenly got everything he ever wanted. And Charlie says, fearfully, what happened? And Wonka says, they live, heavily, uh, they, they live happily ever after. And uh, that's why writers are my favorite people. Somehow, David Salsa had wrapped up the whole picture with a famous line from all... Uh, and it's now one of the most famous closing lines in any movie. <laughs> Mel, I can't thank you enough for being with us tonight. We've shown two of your films on the show now. Maybe one of these days we'll show I Love My Wife, or <laughs> if it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium. All right. <laughs> And Thank always you. remember, Mel, candy is dandy, but liquor is quicker. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Uh, so thank you very much, Joe. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, that was kind of a change of pace for uh, Monster Vision. And uh, for those diehards who are going to be writing me letters saying, that wasn't a Monster Vision movie, well, hang around for a couple of minutes because we have a very gritty prison flick coming up for you, originally a two-part miniseries called Alcatraz, The Whole Shocking Story. But I also want to remind you that next week, after the NBA playoff game, whenever that's over, we'll be showing the always popular Walter Hill classic, The Warriors! Warriors! <laughs> the gang from Coney Island gets caught far, far away from its home turf, and they have to fight their way back home through every other gang in New York while showing an impressive familiarity with the New York City public transit system. Right now, though, we're going to watch Alcatraz, which came out in 1980, and tells the true story of Clarence Carnes, the youngest man ever sentenced to Alcatraz, because he'd escaped from two prisons before Alcatraz, and the long years of planning his escape from The Rock, back when it was considered the only escape-proof prison in America. Now, this is a long mother. I'm warning you right here at the beginning, so I'm going to start the thing off, but I promise you, if you hang in there, it's well worth the effort. I think this would have won a lot of awards, except it was originally aired on TV instead of the big screen. So... Let's look at those drive-in totals, and then go. We have six dead bodies, one country whooping, hot coffee to the crotch, paper eating, steam iron to the hiney, guard beating, four prison escapes, one motor vehicle chase, one gun battle, exploding commode, one shakedown, kung fu, gas grenade fu, four stars. Check it out, and we'll be here to guide you through the rest of the still very young evening and Reno the mail girl will be out here with some jailbreak mail, because how could, how could we resist showing Alcatraz? So, roll it. I know they're already sending the email tonight. They're saying, Joe Bob, what were you thinking? Willy Wonka? What is that? That's not a Monster Vision movie. Well, you know, people get set in their ways watching this show. you got to shake them up, you know? Everybody knows exactly what should be a Monster Vision movie, right? Except me. <laughs> <laughs>